Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Raymond, and thank you for the uh, invitation to present to the audience this morning. As um, you may or may not know, I have a, an alternate life, uh, an alter ego as a microsurgeon. So not only do I do a lot of orthopedic can, I also do um, a large bit of microsurgical reconstruction. So uh, thank you for the opportunity this morning to talk to you about orthoplastics and some of the soft tissue reconstruction options that we have at our disposal now um, in 2020. So I'm gonna start you off just with some food for thought. This, these are all my cases and here's, here's your first patient, an 18 year old rollover MVC. She's looking forward to prom and you can see this devastating 3B both bone form fracture. And I want you to just ask yourself, is this patient a candidate for limb salvage and run through your own minds, how would you get her from this to a salvaged limb? And then you'd ask yourself, of course, what Castillo-Anderson classification is this? This is obviously a 3B, but hopefully throughout this talk, you'll find that all 3B fractures are not created equal, and that's one of the points of this presentation. Here is a gentleman status post a motorcycle accident fresh from a deployment to Germany. He's just out of the military. And you can see here a large segmental tibia defect with an associated soft tissue injury. Is this patient a candidate for limb salvage, just like our last patient? These are the cases that are often presented to me by my colleagues at Shock Trauma, and um, I'm faced with these, these decisions, as I'm sure all of the audience is if you're doing high energy trauma as well. Here's another case of mine, three months into my uh, attending uh, ship at university, a five-year-old who had sustained uh, sepsis through uh, strep pharyngitis and bilateral lower extremity gangrene, necessitating uh, essentially bedside through knee guillotine style amputations. So the question that I'm asked here is, is this patient a candidate for limb salvage? Can we save the distal femora to continue his skeletal growth through his major physis responsible for lower extremity growth? This is a case that was just um, presented about three months to my service. This is a 12 year old who has a osteosarcoma requiring significant resection of the proximal humerus. And so really, the question becomes, what do these patients have in common? And it's pretty obvious that all of these injuries are limb threatening. It's also obvious that there are multiple components that are involved in regards to bone, vessel, skin, and nerve. All of these components are involved, and all of them will require some form of reconstruction, potentially. These surgeries are complex. They're time consuming. They're life altering. And most importantly, they require an integrated approach between the orthopedic surgeon and the microsurgeon slash plastic surgeon. So as I've progressed through this career of first orthopedic microsurgery and now more hand and upper extremity, I started this perhaps as the young Tom Hanks, eager to get going, full of energy. And then like most in practice, I guess, after a few years, you start to wonder, I think I can do this, but it's getting pretty tough. Where do I go from here? And perhaps like some of you, I now feel like castaway on a remote island, wondering if whether or not I can continue to do this because of the challenges that we face. So this treatment requires really alacrity, which is defined as a true for willingness to help, attention to detail, patience, and an integrated approach, as I mentioned. So I wanna keep those things in mind as I take you through some of these cases. One of the most important concepts, I think that the orthopedic traumatologist or anyone who's challenged with limb salvage and orthoplastics is the comprehension and the understanding that the most important part of any of these surgeries, perhaps, is debridement. And debridement is facilitated, as Dr. Shecker mentioned in 2007 in hand clinics, acute reconstruction is facilitated by a good debridement and vice versa. Delayed reconstruction promotes a poor primary debridement. In other words, I often find myself, if I'm forced to do a, a reconstruction or a flap or the microsurgeon who comes behind me, they obviously want to have a clean, uncontaminated tissue bed. No one's gonna invest the time, effort, and money and patient expense and morbidity into a free flap or a reconstruction without doing a absolutely perfect debridement. So in some ways, having that acute reconstruction at your disposal, and perhaps in some cases even forced upon you to cover a nail or a plate or exposed vascular reconstruction will make you do your best debridement possible. So here is an example of a young male who had 
he owns his own lawn scaping company and had inadvertently flipped his lawn mower onto his right shoulder. You can see the mower blades taking portions of his deltoid and posterior scapula out with the mower blade. And this is an illustration of taking this to a, a clean field and doing basically acute debridement and ORIF in the same setting, even this contaminated wound where a massive debridement was completed, new instruments, gowns, drapes, and a prep and drape were used. And so to quote Dr. McGregor, infection is prevented and cured with a knife. And that really, I think, is one of the orthoplastics mottos. That we know that any residual um, necrotic tissue is only going to separate. It's only going to generate infection. So massive debridement, thorough debridement, a tumor-like debridement, as Dr. Marco Godina espoused, is mandatory in any of these limb salvage and orthoplastic type spaces. So moving on to our focal learning objectives, we're going to cover some indications today and what soft tissue options we might have and why we do them, the common flaps that we use, and then the integration of an orthoplastics approach. So in regards to the indications for the residents who might be in attendance this morning, NPs and PAs, generally soft tissue reconstruction is indicated for exposed critical structures. Those include bone, exposed vessel, particular vascular reconstructions, hardware such as tibial nails or plates, or maybe even joint prostheses, and then of course exposed joint, tendon, and nerve. In my practice, generally acute free tissue transfer is not typically indicated. At shock trauma, I, I can't get a free tissue done on a weekend generally, and I've learned that perhaps the one emergent indication where I'll do a free tissue the same day of presentation or within 24 hours would be exposed in critical vascular reconstructions. Those are the cases that as an orthopedic surgeon, we face, uh, and often it's a, a knee dislocation or perhaps a brachial artery that needs to be reconstructed with either graft or PTFE. And when those vet grafts are exposed, dehiscence can lead to rapid exsanguination. And that's what kind of forces our hand to do emergent free tissue. Most other free tissues and soft tissue reconstructions are done electively, sometimes within 24 to 48 hours, but the emergent ones are generally those vascular reconstructions which simply can't wait. So indications for massive soft tissue defects can be from infection as the necrotizing fasciitis case you see on the right hand side here or the traumatic case of the tibial open tibia fracture that we mentioned earlier. And then of course tumor like we mentioned in the osteosarcoma patient. You know historically I think many in the audience recognize the reconstructive ladder as being an important part in regards to how, how we progress from the most simple soft tissue reconstruction to the most complex. And people would recognize, obviously, the audience that we begin with secondary intention, just wet to dries, and then primary closure, delayed closure, skin grafting, whether it be split or full thickness, expansion, and then local and free tissue. However, that thinking, I guess, it might be considered somewhat antiquated. I think it's still useful, but as free tissue and microsurgical efforts have become more commonplace and more people have become trained in regards to performance, the hospitals have become I, I should say more adept as well as the nursing staff in monitoring these, these free tissues. I, I kind of rail against a little bit the concept that I found once quoted in a paper as saying, the utilization of a free flap is not recommended when a simpler solution exists. And I'm not sure that statement holds true anymore. I think that perhaps we should look at it as perhaps in reconstructing the soft tissue defect or the limb in general, we should go to the best solution first, not necessarily the one that is the most complicated or time consuming, because certainly no one wants to lift, for example, a split thickness skin graft off a contracted wound bed in order to get to the tibia to complete a bone grafting. In other words, a full thickness fascia cutaneous free flap will much better afford the orthopedic traumatologist or reconstructive surgeon the ability to lift that graft to do a, a, a much better job at getting soft tissue coverage and, and result in bone grafting. So in some cases that we'll go through here, I'll make that case. In regards to flap options, I have generally broken down flap options into several different categories, local skin, distant skin, free skin, and each of those are different. I'll give you examples of each, local muscle, and then free muscle. In my opinion, those are the main categories. In regards to local skin, here's an example of a young lady who had a severe pilon fracture with significant tibial, posterior tibial neuropathy. It eventually developed a decubitus. The medial plantar artery flap is a flap that doesn't require microsurgical reconstruction. It provides glabrous skin to the heel pad, and it's also enervated. 
So while completing a tarsal tunnel release and finding the medial sural artery, we can transpose that full thickness fascial cutaneous glabrous skin paddle to her calcaneus with a relatively well tolerated um, donor defect about the medial plantar arch of the foot covered with integra and then skin grafting. So that's obviously an example of local skin. Here's an, another example of local skin. I think this particularly is a underutilized flap. This is a patient of one of my colleagues who is a rheumatoid, 60 odd year old female who just had a total elbow arthroplasty. And despite what I thought was good technique, resulted in large full thickness skin loss with eminent hardware exposure and joint exposure. Obviously we wanna avoid this, but a free tissue perhaps in a 68 year old on DMARS and other, other issues is perhaps not the best option. So in this case, what we chose to do is a sensate lateral arm transposition flap. Another example of local skin that is, a, that is simply rotated from the lateral arm to the posterior aspect of the arm and the donor defect is skin grafted. This flap would only take perhaps an hour or an hour or an hour and a half to complete and results in perfectly adequate soft tissue closure and this patient did very well. Here's another example of local skin. I'm not sure how many in the audience are familiar with propeller flaps, but this is gaining traction. This is an example of a, I wouldn't say 24 year old female, part, a patient of my partners had an open tibia, helon fracture complicated with infection, which is obvious in the resultant defect in the medial aspect of her distal leg and exposed antibiotic spacer. What you can see illustrated by these two dots are perforators, that being the axial vessels emanating from the posterior tibial vessel to the subcutaneous plane. And essentially what we do in this case is use these flaps to cover local and small wounds by rotating that flap of skin essentially like a propeller, essentially in this case, almost 180 degrees. In these cases, I'll still use preoperative angiography. In this case, it gets a little complex. This was recently published in a case report in its novelty in that this patient had what's commonly referred to as a perineum magna. She didn't have a posterior tibial artery. In this case, she had a large perineal artery and a dorsalis pedis, which complicates soft tissue reconstruction, obviously, for the medial aspect of the leg. So in this case, we didn't have the posterior tibial vessel uh, available to us for free flap transfer, which would have, would have been my go-to. Rather, we used this perforator that you can see emanating and uh, pointed out by the yellow arrows here from the perineal vessel, coursing along the back of the tibia all the way to the medial skin. Here it again is visualized on a CTA. And then finally, I'm not sure how many of the audience are familiar with SPY, but this video, if I can get it to work, is gonna demonstrate after the administration of indocyanin green through a peripheral IV, and then with exposure a certain wavelength, the detector will detect the bioluminescence, the luminescence rather, of the ICG as it permeates the soft tissues, demonstrating where these perforators lie and the perfusion of the skin envelope. Let's see if I can actually get that to work. And of course, it's a big mess. Great, great, great. Pardon me, guys, sorry about that. Try one more time. There you go, hopefully you can see where the ICG has filled the perforators first here, and you can see a large defect devoid of perfusion. And essentially what that does is gives me a good sense of where those perforators are. We make an anterior incision along the distal part of the leg. We find the perforator, as indicated here by the yellow arrow, and then rotate that skin paddle 180 degrees to cover the soft tissue defect. Hopefully everybody can see what was just done there. So this flap, believe it or not, will only take a, a surgeon who's done a few of them, maybe an hour and a half to two hours. It's the dressings that actually take the longest. And it doesn't require free tissue. So I find it to be a very effective and reliable soft tissue reconstructive option for particularly distal medial leg wounds in patients who may not be candidates for free flap transfer. Here's an example of a local soft tissue wound covered by local skin, a dorsal thumb defect after a GSW. Many of you, I'm sure in the audience, are familiar with the first dorsal metacarpal artery flap that can be used and borrowed from the dorsal aspect of the index finger to cover the dorsum of the thumb, accomplishing acute thumb IP arthrodesis and thumb salvage. Let's talk a little bit about distal skin. What do we mean by distant skin? Distant skin, I think, is obviously something that's not local to the body part, right? So here's a great example of that. Here's a young man who was assaulted with a um, high caliber, low velocity GSW, where you can see a near complete amputation of his thumb, destruction of the bony um, 
components of the base of the thumb as well as a large first web space defect. For the hand surgeons of the audience, we recognize that a first web space contracture, even if the thumb is, is salvaged in this case, can be a real problem. So in this instance, the patient also had a ballistic injury to the forearm resulting in an ulnar artery defect. So in this case, we have a dysvascular thumb with a large soft tissue injury, a bony defect, and so, and of course, limited OR availability in time. So given all these constraints, what we opted to do was essentially an acute uh, debridement, obviously a radical debridement, an acute CMC arthrodesis. Fortunately, this young man had very long thumbs. He was almost morphinoid in a sense and had a great length to his thumbs that permitted this somewhat shortening. A bridge plate for the first web space to maintain the web space. Revascularized his thumb with a dorsal foot vein graft and then a groin flap. So hopefully some of the audience are still familiar with this flap. Masculet quotes in his book that this flap should be known by all surgeons. And I think he may be right. Anybody who's treating any injuries to the hand or upper extremity should be familiar with the groin flap. It is reliable and very expedient and uh, very durable. Of course, the only downside is edema and the dependency of the hand. And of course, a second operation to remove the uh, groin flap at about three weeks after its inosculation and quote unquote parasitization in the recipient bed. But to take a hand from this to this in a year and a half with one slash two operations, if you consider the groin flap division, I think is a very expedient method. So that's an example of distant skin. Of course, cross leg flaps are still in the armamentarium, but very rarely used. Local muscle, obviously everybody remembers the gastrocnemius flap and the medial sural artery is the obvious supply to that flap. I think one of the important things to recognize here about this uh, slide is that the gastroc can be turned to cover the critical defect, which is gonna be the nail you have exposed here. Everything distal to this, although it looks expansive and perhaps not amenable to a local flap, it can be once you've recognized that the critical defect is just the open tibia with the exposed nail. So the gastroc covers quite nicely, as does the periosteum and soleus more distally. So a gastroc flap will do quite, where, quite well there. This is another case of mine, a 20-year-old female who was uh, pedestrian struck, sustaining a 3C tibia. Obviously a devastating injury. Here you can see a large wound about the proximal leg, an antibiotic spacer, and the vein graft used to reconstruct the popliteal artery. And this young lady who is uh, obviously in hypovolemic shock um, and, and undergoing you know, multiple surgical interventions, a free tissue transfer to cover this vascular graft is perhaps not your best option. In this case, upon expiration, we were able to find that the medial gastrocnemius was still viable, even though it had a small shark bite out of it. But guess what? On further identification, we found that the medial sural artery was still patent, had a doperable signal, and the flap was perfectly viable. So we used the medial gastrocnemius to cover the proximal third of the leg. And then here she is after she returned to Germany, uh, converted her X fix to this uh, monolateral frame, and then bone grafting approximately nine months later. Subsequent to this, this young woman has gone on to send me pictures of her dancing and jogging. Uh, she's done quite well and now it's attending dental school. So another example of how powerful a local flap can be, per se, even within the zone, quote unquote, of injury. Going back to our young man who had sustained the bilateral through knee guillotine style amputations, another case where local muscle can be quite powerful. This case, this uh, flap I found in Masculet's book, the vastus lateralis can be reflected on its perforating branches off the popliteal artery and turned to cover the distal femora. So rather than uh, treat this young man to bilateral free latissimus or anterolateral thigh flaps, which would be quite a challenge in this, this young guy who's just off pressors, this local muscle flap, which only took about an hour and a half to harvest and then skin grafting a week later, did very well. Here he is four months status post his um, skin grafting and flap coverage ambulating on his prostheses. He's now 15 and attending high school. Local muscles such as the pectoralis flap can also be very powerful to, to cover open proximal humerus wounds such as the brachial plexus. And, but it's a gimme in a sense when it's already evolved off the humerus. The latissimus is the workhorse for shoulder wounds, but in cases where the wound is more anterior and has been evolved from the humerus or for some other reason there's a chest wound, I find the pectoralis muscle flap to be quite useful. Free muscle is obviously tried and true. Here's an example of a free muscle flap. This is gonna be a gracilis flap that we used in a fix and flap method. The young woman who had fallen off a horse sustaining an open medial distal peline injury. And of course, there's your end aside arterial anastomosis to the posterior tibial vessel, the most common recipient vessel in the leg. 
and the vena comitantis um, anastomose there. Other free muscle cases that I like to show are just how well they um, can mature. When they go on for the residents, I'm sure many residents in the audience have seen some free tissue flaps early in their practice on plastic surgery, what have you, and they look somewhat grotesque, beefy, and somewhat bulky. But in six to eight months, many of these flaps will atrophy because obviously they're denervated and contour quite nicely. Several examples I have shown there. I'd like to show one more case of a free muscle demonstrated here. A young man, alcoholic, unfortunately, was struck by a train sustaining a severely contaminated open distal humerus fracture with associated brachial artery injury. Again, radical debridement is paramount. And this really, these last few cases exemplify the need to combine efforts with your, your microsurgeon or reconstructive surgeon and orthopedist. So here I opted to fuse. This is the only elbow in my practice I've ever arthrodized, but I thought he was the right person for that, being that he was an alcoholic. There was not much elbow left to speak of once the debridement was completed, nor a soft tissue envelope. So an acute elbow arthrodesis was completed, then two days later, we converted that uh, soft tissue to a free latissimus flap. He went on to successful union with only two surgeries. Free skin, obviously the anterolateral thigh flap is important. I'm gonna show you some cases here. But I guess what's important is to recognize when you're presented an injury such as this, you see that this tibia is reflected 180 degrees. It has no capability of soft tissue preservation. And for me, I look at this injury and think, okay, I've got a free flap this week. And of course, that's what it ends up being. Here you have your segmental defect, a provisional external fixator, a periscapular flap. And then of course, in this case, for a lengthy bone defect like this, many would prefer to proceed to distraction osteogenesis, which is completed here with Taylor's spatial frame. This patient is more than two years and I didn't have time to quite pull up his final x-rays, but I believe this man still has his leg. Periscapular flap is also a very a good option for large cutaneous defects of the leg, particularly those that are lateral, because it allows simultaneous harvest. Examples of matured lateral thigh flaps uh, can contour very nicely, as you see here in the forearm and distal third of the leg. I'd like to go back perhaps just one second to the, one of the first cases I showed you, and I think I'll end there because I think um, we're getting close on time. This young lady was the 18-year-old I, I, I presented to you earlier. She had this horrible injury, underwent debridement, osteosynthesis, revascular radial artery, bead pouch, and then two days later, what I thought was a very nice periscapular flap. Unfortunately, either subsequent to an inadequate debridement or perhaps subsequent to the fact that in using her own artery to power this flap, there was additional myo necrosis, and she developed an abscess under her flap at approximately 10 days postoperatively. Unfortunately, this flap became venously congested, and despite uh, take back and leech therapy, we were unsuccessful. So she came in with this arm, and now after a failed flap and two weeks of vac therapy, we are at this arm. I walk into this young lady's room and I say, look, I'd really like to save your arm. She's like, of course, I would, I'd like you to do that too, but I'm not in the mood for any more leeches. So her sister happens to be a nurse, says, what about a groin flap, Dr. Pensy? And I'm like, well, funny, you should ask but I'm, not, I'm afraid that a groin flap won't quite cover this resultant injury. So what we opted to do is we took, a, took the elevator, so to speak. We went from our debridement to the soft uh, free tissue reconstruction and now the soft tissue expansion. So after insertion of two 250 cc soft tissue expanders into our anterior abdomen through those linear incisions here, you can see we've expanded the abdomen and then placed the forearm into this expanded uh, flap essentially. This random pattern thoracoabdominal flap then served her very well. And so after three weeks of inosculation, we were able to delay this flap first from the superior and then inferior margin, essentially resurfacing the, interior, the uh, entirety of her form to permit subsequent bone grafting and tendon transfers. So here's our young lady now, two years from her injury, um, getting ready to graduate college the last time I saw her. So I, with that, perhaps the last slide that I'll touch on is why do these failures, why do we have failures in regards to wound salvage? I think the inability to control massive wounds, here's a uh, ipsilateral open femur, a tibia fracture we covered with the latissimus. You can see necrosis of the latissimus flap. This is perhaps the largest flap that we can come up with. So in some cases, some wounds are just too big. The inability to provide revascularization to the mangled limb through a large graft is also, in my experience, not an uncommon way to, to have a failure. 
failing to achieve adequate rigid fixation that is also soft tissue friendly. So a nail that is, that is loose or tenting the skin or tenting a pedicle or a plate that does the same, we're not co controlling rotation of an extremity during revascularization or free tissue transfer is obviously a dilemma. The inability to execute microsurgery, and of course the inability to regenerate and heal bone. And I think perhaps this is honestly the main reason I've seen limb salvage failures is that in some of these defects that you saw, the skeletal defect is just simply too large to get adequate healing in an infection-free manner. And of course, the last one, we will have patients who simply will elect for amputation if we fail to meet their expectations. And with that, I'd like to end. Saki, I don't know if we have any time for questions or we'll just uh, press on with the conference, but I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions if we have time. Um, I don't, you know, with the format of a meeting, we don't really have everybody unmuted and just with 150 people, it's all hard to make it that, that interactive. Um, let, me, let, me, let me ask Ray. I have the chat room and I obviously have the faculty uh, unmuted. Saka, let me ask Ray a question. So, um, you know, Ray, what you discussed was great. And I think that for, for the majority of orthopedic surgeons that don't do a lot of coverage work, um, um, it's often becomes a bit foreign in terms of their, uh, in terms of their uh, understanding of the reconstructive ladder and the strategies that are employed. What, what's, your, what's your takeaway? Uh, what's your one takeaway to the orthopedic surgeons and PAs and residents on, on this uh, symposium in terms of when they're dealing with a, with a complex wound, a, a 3A, 3B, and even 3C wound? Um, you mentioned one thing about debridement, but overall, in terms of um, what, how should they how should they be thinking about this, and how should they be thinking about uh, fixation in the setting of, of a wound like this, just broadly speaking? Yeah, that's obviously a, a very a, a great question, and really difficult to sum it up in just one quick or one or two sentences. But I'll do my best. I think the best way to achieve limb salvage, if you're at a level one trauma center, is to get a group of uh, people, guys, gals, what have you. Who are kind of who are more or less committed to that effort. So someone who has a true interest and a, a zeal for soft tissue, who's willing to expeditiously and rapidly work with the orthopedic surgeon and involve that person or persons early. So as you as you might, you know, I don't know about you, Asif, but I'll get a text message with an open humerus. And if I see a segmental chunk of bone flipped 180 degrees, I'm already thinking soft tissue, right? Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, it's probably worth a call to your microsurgeon, plastic surgeon, what have you. Get them in and get their impression on what the best soft tissue options might be. And that'll obviously be taken into context with some of the things that I talked about. If there's an acute vascular reconstruction, although bead pouches will work to temporize, for me, that's something that I have to cover early, probably within a day, lest that vascular reconstruction to hiss. And of course, then you'll have skeletal defects. If you have defects that you're gonna to need to bone graft or lengthen, I'm thinking about fascia cutaneous flaps that then can be elevated um, repeatedly. In some instances, we've had patients with flaps that have been eleva elevated four or five, six times mm -hmm. for masculine techniques. So I guess the point is, have someone in your back pocket that you trust to do the soft tissue work, someone who's capable, competent, and expeditious, and involve them early, maybe even as soon as you see an x-ray that looks suspicious. Yeah, I was really ho hoping you'd say that I think the key and in, 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 from my perspective what you shared is that team approach and this is typically these coverage techniques are typically not something utilized by most orthopedic surgeons um, and it's important if you're going to be treating these type of complex injuries to have a team approach get them involved early nowadays with access to our phones on, on our on our waist and our pockets it's even easier to do that but get them involved early in the process so they're considering uh, what their next steps or what their initial steps are going to be so they can inform your initial steps in terms of fracture management. Um, and, and proceeding that manner, I think, is, is really, the, 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 to me, the takeaway in terms of how to, to treat these injuries best. So thanks, Ray, for doing that. It was a great talk. Awesome. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add just one quick thing. You know, sure. I didn't share much literature, but out of the UK, you know that they've had several studies regarding their ability to get these kind of wounds transferred to centers that that treat 3Bs routinely. And they've shown improved results in regards to them salvage and complication profiles. I think that we're certainly on that, that edge as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you see a wound that's definitely will require a flap of some sort, don't hesitate to get that to a center that, that makes this part of their business and part of their practice. Agreed, agreed. Thanks, Ray.
Thank you. Thanks. Great points. I'm going to um, crank up the volume here. Is that better? Yeah, awesome. that was great. I'm a little jealous, but yes, that's good. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. 